saying uh, the ECIA is uh, organizing a number of webinars uh, following our risk in focus document, uh, which all of you probably know a very well received uh, document which we already produce for a number of years. And uh, one of the key topics, so maybe you can go to the next slide. Um, Check the other speakers. There's some sound, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Everybody mutes the speakers, so probably that's the best. Um, yeah, well, here uh, we have a chart in which we show uh, the risk uh, rankings and uh, the recent years, uh, some risks uh, rapidly uh, have risen in the ranking, uh, but also have been fading away. For example, those ones who were related uh, to the pandemic, such as uh, business continuity and uh, to some extent also the financial and liquidity risks. Uh, but we now see, of course, uh, not surprisingly, the geopolitical risk uh, rising and, and, and boosting uh, to the top. Uh, uh, but still on the top, we have uh, cybersecurity, uh, which is uh, will and uh, is, a, is a big topic and also will stay a big topic. Uh, uh, but as Pascal was also mentioning, uh, the digital disruption and new technology is, is still a big topic. And not only now, but especially uh, it is expecting uh, to rise also uh, towards uh, uh, 2026 and the coming years. Uh, yeah, can go to the next slide, Pascal. Thank you. Well, yeah, uh, what we see here is uh, uh, the, the top five risks on which internal audit spends most time and effort. Uh, uh, and for example, uh, for macroeconomics uh, and geopolitical uncertainty, there's a big gap between uh, the priority we give and uh, uh, the time spent. So uh, that's the point of attention. Uh, but we, what we also see in practice that, that especially the topic we are discussing upon, so digital new technology is what we look, uh, so when we look at the time spent, this topic is still on the eighth place, but on the other hand, the ranking of the risk priority is, is, is rather high. So this is a point of attention. Uh, yeah. And then we have our last slide. Uh, and that is where we expect uh, to spend the most time uh, for the coming years, uh, for the coming year, but also the time uh, we would like to spend in 2026. Uh, please, Pascal. <laughs> yes. Um, and there we see in the second row, uh, Pascal was a bit too quick, but it's not a problem. But in the second row, row we see digital disruption uh, on the second place already. So uh, we expect in 2026 uh, to spend a lot of time on that, uh, besides, again, cybersecurity. So uh, worthwhile to discuss uh, upon. Uh, um, but I also would like to introduce our panelists. Uh, I don't know whether they are visible in the room yet, but uh, we have uh, three very uh, well-educated panelists. And first I'd like to introduce uh, Shirar Humayan. Uh, Shirar Humayan is Audit Director, Applications, uh, Data and Applied Sciences at Lloyds Bank. Uh, he has been uh, leading uh, in, in the data analytics strategy uh, for the internal audit function. Uh, he has a background in software engineering, so a technical back background, and he started his career in IT before moving to audit. So uh, not surprisingly, uh, very well known on this topic. Our second panelist is uh, Robert Segenyi. Uh, he is Global Head of Internal Audit Operations and Technology and uh, also the Global Business Ventures. Uh, uh, for example, also the new digital insurance offerings. Uh, and he's doing that job at uh, Zurich Insurance. Uh, 
Now, Robert is, is a recognized expert uh, in, 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 in various topics in enterprise risk management, uh, but also a lot of digital and data related topics. Uh, and uh, also worthwhile mentioning, Robert is the founder of the head of the uh, head of the audit experience group of data science uh, within IIA and also in ISACA. He is very uh, active. Uh, and last but not least, we have uh, Adel uh, Ramani. Uh, Adel is a group CIE of uh, Descartes Underwriting. Uh, that's an insure tech uh, in, in insurance products. Uh, he is also uh, an experienced auditor. He had different positions in uh, in, in AXA Group, uh, but also in the Societe Generale. And he is co-founder uh, of the fast-growing organization working group within IIA. So uh, looking at folk and focusing on, on identifying uh, emerging risks, uh, including the tech-related risks. So, uh, well, uh, very much appreciated that you spend your time, uh, Robert, Sherry, uh, and Adele. And then I would like to go to the first uh, question. Um, That's a question to you all, to the public. Um, and what are the key areas where your organization uh, introduced the digitalization? And I think the poll is already uh, done. Do you want to have some more time, uh, Pascal, or is it okay? Uh, we already posted I the think question. It, I think it's okay. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. Well, it is very clear. <laughs> It is a very clear poll. Uh, so uh, we introduce uh, in our organizations uh, uh, digitalization for the most in, in processes. Uh, so, uh, uh, well, that's a clear answer. Uh, uh, and that's also a question uh, I would ask to would like to ask to the panel, uh, uh, Robert, uh, Sheriar and, uh, and, and Adele. Uh, uh, what in your organizations, what are the key areas where uh, digitalization was uh, was introduced? Uh, maybe Sherryar, you can start. Thanks, Astrid. C can you hear me? Yes. All right. Firstly, thanks for having me on the panel. Um, I, I believe digital digitalization is now an imperative for all organizations and specifically for the financial services sector. A retail customer has their entire life on a mobile thanks to the smartphone revolution, but equally our corporate clients also expect more digital interaction. So clearly, Lloyd's Banking Group being uh, the biggest digital bank in the UK, for my organization as well as for other banks, there is a massive focus on providing and enhancing customer experience through digitalization. This is about all aspects of customer journeys from account opening to loan applications to mortgages. In fact, if you think about it, when was the last time you went to a bank branch? So customers, both retail and corporate now expect multiple digital channels to facilitate these banking activities. So there is a lot of focus on making that experience seamless by making it simple, convenient and user friendly. As we move forward, Providing digital channels isn't enough for financial services organizations on its own, but there's also a focus to provide additional value to the customer through a personalized service. Big techs have massively increased customer expectations in terms of the digital service they get. Customers expect a heightened level of personalization uh, as that provided by the likes of uh, Amazon, Netflix, uh, and Spotify, whereby they proactively identify customer needs. And this is through using the power of data to offer products that are suitable to the customer at that stage of their life. This is where artificial intelligence and machine learning comes in and has a massive potential, and hence a lot of focus from our organization and the banks uh, across, across the spectrum. AI and ML, as I'd call them, is now they're now helping with making the digital customer experience more value add, for example, through smarter chatbots. The other aspect to bear in mind is that you can't digitalize customer interaction without digitalizing your backend processes. As we saw in the poll as well, that's the highest area of digitalization as well, based on your attendees' response. This is because you need speed and efficiency to be able to process and respond to millions of data points and events that are generated through customer interactions. Uh, 
Now there is a massive focus on automation of back office processes, for example, through rationalizing systems in the cloud or through the use of robotic process automation and the use of data analytics and AI. This also includes processes to increase resilience across the digital platforms, but also to make processes and systems more nimble to be able to adapt to an increasing pace of change. The list goes on and the pace of change is mind boggling whereby the need for financial services to catch up with the innovation being introduced by the big tech quickly is becoming increasingly urgent. Now, this can be quite challenging, particularly for large organizations uh, that may need to compete with more nimble challenger banks. Um, I hope that gives you a high level view of where we're focusing in terms of digitalization aspect. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Hirar. Uh... And Robert, uh, uh, can you um, uh, elaborate a little bit on that uh, in your experience? What are the key areas where your organization introduced digitalization? Yeah, we are a very large organization uh, delivering services to over 210 countries. Um, similar as Shira, I would say I would differentiate between back end and front end. Um, front end is really everything that is customer facing. Um, that's probably the, the most investment in the front end because that's where we see the customer experience. With front end, I also mean new products. Um, in the insurance space, that's, that's new insurance models, usage based models, device protection, parametric insurance. Um, but then also, I would say in the back end, there, there is quite an investment um, on one side in the infrastructure, but also uh, business processes, automation, um, APIs. We see a lot uh, in, the in the distribution as well. Um, how we use direct distribution or other parties, how we integrate them in a, an ecosystem for different products. Um, and I think that's probably the most uh, growing part as well, how we create ecosystems and how we um, interact automatically, automatically and seamlessly for the customer with uh, third parties and other um, market uh, participants. Yeah. Weren't you a little bit surprised that it's such a big uh, part of the digitalization the processes? I would also have expected to have more it's a focus on business model, but maybe uh, also Adele can say something yeah. about it. Yeah, I was a bit surprised. It really probably depends on, uh, <laughs> uh, on the participants. I would say in startups, it's, it's much more on the business model because yeah. they first to define the business model and then um, the investment falls afterwards. Um, I think a lot of uh, more traditional businesses start with the process, start with they have what they have. Yeah. But, yeah, but not sure that gives most value out of the investments. Yeah, 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 yeah. But well, maybe that's something Adele can uh, can uh, say something about uh, in your environment in insure tech. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I, I will try. A lot of have been said, so maybe we just add few additional informations. Um, I, I will start by saying that in terms of digitalization, you have. I would say two aspects. First one, you would you digitalize your processes for your customer experience, or yeah. you digitalize the processes in order to gain in efficiency. Uh, with, within Descartes Group, we are a PNC uh, commercial lines company, i.e., we don't have a uh, um, uh, lot of uh, clients. We we work mainly with uh, with big companies. And, and as such, the customer experience um, objective is not the main one, I would say. Uh, this is why our philosophy is to digitalize the functions, the, the, the internal functions of the company in order to be able to allocate uh, most of our resources to our core business uh, and not to the, to the support functions. Uh, so, in, in terms of core business, we do use uh, artificial intelligence in uh, modeling simply because um, uh, the way we model risks is, uh, is a prospective approach 
And this is why AI is really important in doing so. The other aspect of the dig digitalization we have within Descartes is uh, all what we have implemented in support functions such as in finance, accounting, uh, and it's a lot of, uh, it's, it, it goes through the use of a lot of uh, software as a services tools. Yeah, okay. Well, in, um, in, this, in this area, I would say that uh, the, main, the main risk would be the dependence to, or the high dependence to software uh, as a service tools. Um, in, well, what, what, what maybe is important to mention and what Robert uh, rightly said is that uh, the, the digitalization will be different from a uh, startup scale-up company and the mature company. In a startup and scale-up company, the aim from scratch is to be able to um, digitalize all what you can digitalize and, and you do it in all the ways when in a mature company, um, you have a lot of uh, other aspects to consider when, when deciding which area you, you want to digitalize. So this is maybe one important question to have in mind. Uh, before deciding to to go into a digitalization project within your organization. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Adalia. Actually, your organization is a kind of new business model eh, based on uh, digitalization. And of course, then you uh, digitalize all your processes. Uh, so uh, it's very clear. And we go to the next poll because we want to involve you, uh, our, our viewers or our listeners. Uh, we have the next poll. Uh, in, in what way are US internal auditors involved in digitalization projects in your organization? Is that sometimes it's uh, from the beginning, yeah, it's, it's never or when the pro project is finalized? Uh, we are very interested in that one. I think we have uh, a rather uh, stable view now. Uh, uh, actually, 50% uh, that's positive, I think, is at least uh, sometimes involved in digitalization uh, projects. Uh, uh, so that is good. Uh, and uh, that is uh, for a large part also when the project is finalized. Uh, but we also have some people who are never involved. Uh, uh, and also some uh, from the beginning, but at least we are uh, involved as uh, internal auditors, which I think is is very important uh, uh, to be. Uh, and we want to be a trusted advisor, so that is. Uh, I think this is a very important uh, topic in in all of our organizations. So we should not uh, stay on the side. I think. Uh, I don't know whether you want to comment on that in this, uh, Robert or Adele or Sharyar. Uh, Not, Actually, not su surprisingly, but uh, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd probably uh, uh, my comment would be I just make a quick comment as I, I, I think ideally we should be engaged right from the start. We should have a view of the key digitalization projects happening yeah. across the group. Depending on the organization, we may not always get to all of them, but uh, on risk basis, uh, I've actually experienced that we, we tend to get involved in almost all of them on risk basis. Um, and you need to have a different mindset to, to, to how you get involved, whether you do flash reports or whether you, you do a program audit, different mechanisms and tools to getting involved. But I absolutely agree with you, Astrid. It's uh, absolutely imperative that we do get involved in these projects and get an early view of the risk as opposed to coming in after the fact. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sheriad, I completely agree. Uh, and we have to look at our products, of course, but we should be uh, involved. We, uh, I, uh, I also have one, one question uh, for you uh, from how can uh, can organization enable a culture of innovation, promote it and, and maintain it? I think that is one thing that is very important to drive digitalization in an organization. Uh, 
Uh, Robert, would you like to comment on this one? Uh, uh, what do you think are important uh, items uh, uh, in this area? Yeah, very happy to elaborate a bit. I think we need to differentiate again. Uh, is it a more mature company, more mature business, or is it a startup type? I mean, for a startup type, uh, innovation and culture of innovation is, is key to um, survive and to establish actually a business model. Um, business model needs to be adapted, changed in a startup, and that's really need to be the core of, of the culture. But I also believe a more mature business needs to, to find a way to innovate because the, the change in, in digital is actually pressing a lot uh, old business model out in the market. Um, new, new distribution channels will change, uh, new ecosystem will develop. And if, if more mature businesses is not, are not able to innovate uh, with, with that change, they they will either taken over or will degrade in, in, in value. So um, aligning the innovation to, to business value is in my view, probably the key to innovation. And there's different concepts more mature companies are adopting. So we, we see different concepts in um, the industry. Um, one is, for example, an innovation lab. Um, there's always a bit of a question on organization of innovation and incentivization of innovation. If you stick with the old incentivization models, um, which always worked, then that perhaps will not work and will not get the right drivers for innovation. Um, then you don't want to sometimes torpedo your, your existing business. So companies start, started to develop sandboxing, meaning carve out a certain part of the business where they allow, allow trying, prototyping, testing the market. Um, M&A is also an important part. Do you want to buy and already companies as a certain degree of maturity, which bring innovative products to your, to your business? You can do that in different level. You can try to buy very early startups. They're definitely cheaper, but the risk is much higher. Then you can go into the more mature um, um, innovator in the digital space, intertech uh, um, financing. Um, that can be done over an investment fund or with own funds. And so company try try really to um, have different approaches and. Uh, there's probably not uh, a, a, an answer which one works best. So the, there's probably a combination of, of the different uh, yeah. elements. Yeah. So um, what you say there's not, not one size fits all. There's a one, okay. There are more solutions for the for the topic. Uh, I would say so. And uh, at the end, it's really to establish a, a culture where this is allowed. And also culture where you fail because in innovation, um, you often fail as well, specifically if you try to develop um, new business models. Yeah, yeah. We don't need to be too afraid to fail, eh? so uh, <laughs> otherwise though, well, things won't change. Uh, would, you, would, would you like to comment on it, uh, Adele or Gerardi? Uh, what what are, do you think are important topics uh, really to have a innovative culture in companies? Uh, yeah, maybe maybe quickly I would I would add that a, a ton at the top is important yeah. in terms of enabling culture of innovation. Of course, and uh, as Robert said, uh, it's easier when innovation um, adds value in terms of business of new business uh, or enhance the operations. It's less easy to promote it when it's matter of profitability. Uh, we we tend to see it as uh, reducing costs. And it's not always positive or seen as a positive thing. Uh, but, but yeah, definitely, I think that the tone at the top is the, the starting point for innovation and especially in mature companies. Yeah. yeah. OK, that's uh, that's also your opinion, Sharia, or do you see as topics? Uh... I, actually, I, I think I'll, uh, Robert and Adil have quite quite effectively covered uh, yeah. the, the key areas. The two things I'd call out, one of the things uh, from you uh, that you mentioned, the fear of failure, we need to get past that. 
Yeah. Uh, we should call it learning fast, right? And the organizations need to embed that culture. Secondly, a very pertinent point that Adil raised was about having innovation as part of your company's values. So we've got four values, five values actually across the group, and one of them is actually being bold. And that's that also links into challenging the current processes and, and sort of uh, coming up with, with better ways of doing things. So I, I absolutely agree. I think it, it's about the tone at the top that sets yeah. it going. Okay, yeah, that's a wonderful example on how the tone at the top can be uh, uh, made, made very practical. Eh? So to be very clear in your values that you want to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, learn fast, fail fast. Eh? That's a little bit what you were saying. Okay, well, I'd like to go uh, because time is flying to the to the next uh, question, uh, and that is a little bit our uh, our subject, uh, our uh, profession. Uh, how should your uh, your other digitalization in initiatives, such as uh, uh, artificial intelligence tools, uh, used in the business? Uh, how should you, as audit, align to that? Um, uh, well, can you say something about that, Adele? Uh, how, what is your view on that? Uh, how do you approach this one? Uh, yeah, how sure. do you audit all these new tools, new developments? Well, uh, I think that first we, we should start from the starting point, which is the identification of the new risks related to a greater digitalization. Uh, we spoke about the dependency to external providers when using software as services uh, tools. Yeah. Um, but we, we can also decide to develop internally some tools. And, uh, and as such, we may have also resistance to change, uh, especially in mature organizations, uh, or uh, risks such as uh, project failures, uh, also mainly in mature organizations. Um, well, based on the appearance of the new risks, um, another maybe important aspect is the ability to quickly identify the changes to the risk profile of the company and reorient the audit plan during the year uh, and not waiting too much or too long in, in, before deciding or proposing to, to modify the, the audit plan. Um, and maybe last thing I would say that, um, well, whilst it's, um, it's uh, very difficult to onboard um, specific uh, skills within the company, especially tech and IT skills, maybe it's even more difficult to do so or to do it uh, within internal audit department. Um, so we, we have to have in mind that we are speaking here about uh, um, profiles that we are not to, not used to have uh, within our companies. Uh, tech profiles are very often um, not interested, interested, sorry, or attracted by uh, uh, aspects such as uh, uh, remuneration or power, etc. And they are also profiles that are able to, to work a lot as freelancers to move from one sector to another. And, and this is why it's really difficult to, to attract them and to retain them. And, and, and this is one important point we have to have in mind be, before starting to audit uh, digitalization and, and topics such as uh, AI. So yeah, you say, say uh, it's another uh, important topic in our risk in focus uh, document, uh, the human capital risk and the shortage of this. And, and do we have, and, and as you were mentioning, we should have the right competences uh, to really audit uh, uh, these new topics. So that's a, a challenge uh, uh, in it. And, and maybe also, as we were mentioning before, uh, uh, it is also important to uh, to think about our products, eh? to think about the other products we have. Uh, we already said we want to be at the start of these projects involved, eh? but that's also saying something about uh, what kind of products do we need. Uh, uh, we were mentioning flash reports. Uh, do you want to add a little bit on that, uh, Robert? How do you see, uh, see uh, the way we audit uh, these new technologies and these, these digital developments? What kind of products uh, uh, do we have as audit? 
Yeah, I would I would put it also in a in a context of three lines of defense. So what we always like to understand yeah. is what, what is first lines control cro- control around um, these new products, new digital uh, initiatives. Second line involvement. What what is the governance around it? Uh, first, the decision making where to invest. Um, what are the business cases, um, and then also what are all the risks coming uh, with, with uh, these uh, projects. And uh, for that, um, I would say we can look at it from different lenses and the, the products, you mean the audit products, uh, probably relate a bit to that. We can look at it from a governance perspective, then um, that's, that's probably more a, a broad governance audit uh, are the roles and responsibility clear? Do we have the right approvals? Are the business cases uh, managed? How do we um, um, measure um, the success of these uh, initiatives? Um, do we know when actually um, to stop? Because when we say we fail, we want to fail and we don't want to drag costs um, over a long time. That's also quite important in these uh, new initiatives uh, to try on the market. Um, then um, we we did quite a lot of sprint type audits, agile audits um, uh, for some of these initiatives to be very close uh, to the development, um, very short checkpoints in longer projects um, are more efficient than having one long audit, I think. Um, and then uh, quick feedback to the business. So sometimes these uh, projects are, are really um, very, developed very in, 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 in a sprint-like uh, uh, environment. So if we wait to report out too long, um, our, our relevance is, is not here anymore. Um, and the impact also we have to the pro- project is not there. So I think on the onset, specifically if it comes to uh, control design and control automation should be very early in the project. And with all this digital, the nice thing is if, if you have a digital project, you can in, implement the controls automatically. So they are part actually of the products. And if they are added on at the end of the digital project, will be much more expensive, will be automa- not automated, will need often manual uh, interaction. So if you build and help in building the controls in, in uh, digital, that, that um, improves the efficiency significantly. So you say we have a role in all the steps of the development in these projects. Eh? So uh, already at the start, uh, those must have already uh, be uh, be involved in risk identification, and so through the whole uh, uh, development and and, uh, and and the different phases of of these projects. Uh, um, uh, maybe a question uh, also for you still, Robert. Do, you mentioned these products. Uh, do you think it is a combination of assurance and advice, or you say, well, assurance is not possible in this in this area? Um, no, definitely assurance is is possible. It really depends on the stage of of the development. At the at the beginning, it could be a, a quick sprint report. That's still yeah. a kind of assurance because we looked at the design. Are the controls automated? Are they designed rightly? Um, still assurance work. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I think if we are quick and agile, we can actually give assurance through the whole onset. But as I said, the earlier we give that, the more impactful it is and the more economic it is for the project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and Sherry, uh, would you like to comment on this one? Uh, Still, oh, we already have the next question, but still a little bit. I think it's an important topic on the other products. Uh, what is your experience? Do you perform audit activities on this? Is it assurance or is it more advice? And which part of the cycle? Um, so, uh, Astrid, we, we, we've actually, uh, to Robert's point, uh, to Robert's point there, there are multiple um, ways to tackle it. Firstly, we've got a specific product called Change Assurance, whereby we issue flash reports uh, as part of that uh, throughout the l- l- life cycle of a, of a strategic program or project. Uh, but I, I think a couple of quick points I want to I want to chat I want to mention is firstly, 
through our business monitoring, which is very important, we should get in early on these projects because a lot of the digitalization projects are tech led, whereas they should be business led. The business value should actually drive what technology we want, we want to up, upgrade to or what technologies or digitization we want to roll out. Because quite often you end up doing something digitally, but the value it provides, we find out later on, isn't isn't per expectation. So I think that's that's a very important part. Other than governance and standards, so as I said, we've got to change assurance product and then we do um, regular audits on them as well. Uh, yeah. But one point I'd want to focus in on is some of the advanced AI type, uh, artificial intelligence type initiatives that are being taken or rolled out in, in the group. We need to look at those in a lot more detail than we've done in the past. A lot of those programs may have data ethics implications, especially which is associated with AI. And we should have the capability to be up to apply the data ethics lens to it as to whether the model you're rolling out has any bias, even if it, it has no financial implication on the group. So I think th th those are the three things I'd probably talk about. Yeah, OK, that is that's already a little bit our next question. Eh? So you say already you have experience in using AI in uh, in uh, in auditing AI yeah? and to be very clear on the ethical parts uh, of it, which is, uh, I think, a very important topic. Uh, 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 we actually we are also writing a paper upon uh, for parts, so that is uh, very good. Uh, but we also have AI in our audit work, eh? so uh, we can use it in making our work as auditor uh, easier and maybe uh, more efficient. Uh, do you have any experience in that, uh, Shirian, uh, using artificial intelligence in uh, in auditing? Yeah, uh, I, I think on that aspect, uh, yeah, we have been we have been using it uh, specifically around machine learning. Our experience of using machine learning, which is of course a part of AI, has, has been has been brilliant. Uh, Eighty percent of all the data any organization holds is unstructured data, which is it's not which means it's not stored in tables or numbers. It would be text, video, speech, and so on and so forth. And our ability to tap into that data through natural language processing has yielded a lot of results for us, and that has enhanced our assurance capability as well. So we've used machine learning on customer communications, how we communicate with customers and whether that aligns with what was what, expected. We've used uh, machine learning on complaints data uh, as well. Um, and then we've used machine learning on risk data as well. And we've used various techniques uh, from classification to clustering to outlier detection. Um, and that's actually given us additional capability and tools to look into areas that we couldn't look at, look at in the past. So uh, I've actually, our team's actually built up this capability over the past three to four years. And now we regularly use uh, a lot of these techniques uh, on a lot of data and of course um, the structured data, but also unstructured data. Now I know RPA, which is robotic process automation or optical character recognition. These are advanced techniques. They don't qualify under AI, strictly speaking, but we've been using those techniques as well to again to enhance our capability to broaden our assurance essentially. Yeah. Uh, so it's very interesting. So not only you have done now your audit work in a more efficient and maybe even more in-depth way, yeah, but you also have broadened your scope. So certain areas you never looked at. Can you can you give an example of an area you say, well, I was never uh, interested in that or focused in it in, in audit, but now I've done it uh, with help of AI. So I'd uh, probably give you an example of uh, complaints, for instance, right? How we look at complaints. There is, uh, we use a model to, we, we actually developed a model to categorize complaints. 
depending on how they should be created. So there would be various categories of complaints. So each category of complaint would get a certain type of treatment by the group. And whilst the business does the categorization of those complaints manually, what we did was we used data from two prior years to train a model on how complaints should be categorized. And then we ran it on the third year to see as to whether the complaint categorization is, is accurate or not. So yeah. in the past, we wouldn't have thought about looking at it. We did something similar with risk event categorization as well, how risk events are categorized as well, how their root causes are categorized as well. So these are some of a couple of areas where we've actually used uh, AI in the past. In one case, uh, we couldn't test the model by recreating the model because that takes a lot of effort and time, right? So what we did was we actually ran outlier detection. We used, we, we, we created a small model for outlier detection and that's how we got to whether there are any outputs coming out of the model which should be questioned or which should be explored further. And again, that yielded a lot of results as well. So these okay. are two or three examples I, I thought I'd, yeah. I'd share. Yeah, that's very helpful. So you you actually did a kind of predictive analysis and challenged, let's say, the outcomes of the business, which I think is really uh, well adding value, I think, to the business and give uh, other insights. Uh, uh, Robert, uh, do you also have experience in using artificial intelligence or machine learning in your uh, internal audit work? Uh, I'm sure you have, but uh, can you say something about it? Yeah, we are investing in that actually uh, since a few years. Um, we are trying to apply, I mean, the te techniques which really make sense to uh, the topic um, or the area we are looking at. So we are using AI techniques in the whole value chain of, of auditing. We already use it in the, in the planning phase. Um, when, when we do our yearly risk assessment or quarterly risk assessment uh, for, for our audits, there we use a lot of unsupervised learning. Um, the anomaly model to find out trends or patterns or elements in the business which, which we then investigate further and try to identify is that really a key risk or a key uh, trigger point which um, then triggers an audit. Um, then when we come to scoping of audits, we also use a lot of data very early in the audit process. So um, even before we actually start our audit, we gather data and we try to um, identify the highest risk of concerns. Could be, you know, geographic agencies, distributions, um, certain um, products, um, and we try to identify that also with um, so AI supervised tools, um, the, the highest risk, still um, a lot of unsupervised learning. Um, then when it comes to all the testing, we deploy a lot of, of already supervised learnings where we have actually training data, um, fraud techniques, anomaly models. Um, we also use for root cause analysis, for example, decision trees to identify the driver of, of certain root cause, causes of uh, our audit issues. And we use natural language processing a lot uh, because we have a lot of unstructured data in claims, in complaints, in uh, yeah, a lot of, of insurance related uh, files. Uh, that helps us also to um, use full data don't do a sample sample approach and identify that there is based on uh, full data sets. Um, and then we really close the loop for even issue retesting. We also sometimes use AI um, um, to close the loop then up to um, complete identification or resolution of the risks. So in the whole cycle, uh, very interesting. So it's it's a combination of, of uh, let's say, very uh, more intelligent data analysis towards uh, unsupervised artificial intelligence and supervised. So it's it's getting, uh, let's say, uh, at a higher level continuously, I think, as, I, as you mentioned, uh, Robert. And it, um, I'm just keeping up the knowledge also in, in the department. And our biggest successes are when we actually can hand over 
some of our routines to the business, um, which really worked. Um, our model is that way that um, we can take the algorithms we use straightforward to the business and they can reuse it. So that's yeah. really our biggest successes. You are kind of front runner and, and uh, 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 let's say start a spinning wheel, as I say, so for the business. Uh, it's very good. Uh, um, yeah, before I think we go to uh, uh, the Q&A from the audience, uh, Adele, is there something would, would you like to add from your own experience? Uh, I can't see you anymore, Adele, but... <laughs> I'm here, I'm here. Oh, you're just still there. Okay, yeah. Right. So much has been, has been, have been said by, by my colleagues, so I think it, it, it's fine. We, we had a very large spectrum of experiences, so nothing really different from our side. Ah, okay. Ah, I see uh, an interesting one from uh, Antoine. Uh, I know Antoine. <laughs> and it's something we were discussing last week uh, on, on, uh, on chat, uh, GPT. Uh, of, okay, uh, uh, a new technology. Uh, uh, is, is there anyone uh, from you, uh, maybe Sharia, uh, that is using uh, this one? Uh, in your own uh, processes, and have you assessed it? Uh... So, uh, uh, I think after we we haven't. Uh, so there, there's a lot of talk about Chat GPT and yeah. what it's being used for. Uh, it's 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 been trained on data, and I think it's taken years to train it on data. And then there's a lot of what happens in the background, and we don't see if there's been a lot of manual intervention in terms of the data that 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 it's been uh, used to train on as well. And that's dated about eighteen months back. So if you ask Chat GPT, who's the current prime minister of the UK, it would it won't give you the right answer. So I think it it has its uses. The real thing is the use case it it creates for us in organizations. If we have a Chat GPT. Uh, type solution that does NLP, natural language processing, but also NLG, natural language generation. We could do a lot by pointing it to our internal data as well as some public data. So we haven't done anything as yet. I think it's, it's too early and I think because of the security policies of the group, uh, I don't think we'd be able to do much with it so far, but I, I think it clearly offers a lot of opportunities, especially as we think about Chat, intelligent chatbots and so on and so forth. There is a lot of potential going forward for 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 its use cases. Yeah, so, so it would help us, but be careful not to, uh, because be be aware it's using always all data. So uh, you always need the human factor. <laughs> and maybe that's also a, a good step to uh, to another question. I saw it running uh, on the screen, uh, but also I think uh, it's on the top of this list. Uh, do we actually have the right capabilities and expertise and experience uh, to really get involved in these projects? Uh, maybe Adele, you can comment on it, on it. What are the HR challenges in this area, not only maybe for the business, but also especially for uh, for the audit department. Uh, yeah, well, as mentioned, then def definitely it's a, it's a hot topic. Well, first for the business and then for audit. We we I think that we always have to think about the business first and make sure that the capabilities are within the business and the right one. And and then as a third line of defense, we also after that needs to think about our, our our skills and our capabilities but again it's 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 a um, it's an issue for the business and it's an issue for us and we definitely need to seriously uh, start thinking about it uh, just not not just having one ft for 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 such topics but maybe changing the skills of the whole department of course we will need to and always need to have um, uh, internal uh, auditors as ge generalist auditors, but I think that the, the need for IT skills within internal audit is no longer a question. No, that is, uh, and we were also mentioning in our uh, preparation for this seminar eh, that we need to think uh, global and outside of our own, uh, let's say, uh, community. Uh, 
So uh, with with all the shortage in personnel and knowledge, uh, yeah, we we really need to think wide and broad and. Uh, uh, Look at different experience. We can no longer uh, uh, have one IT auditor, as you mentioned, with some capabilities, but we need maybe uh, uh, from different countries specific skills and be health very flexible on that topic. Uh, indeed, indeed. Uh, well, if, if we say our setup within Descartes, we have uh, here in the Paris office 22 nationalities not only within internal audit, but in the whole company and 50% yeah. of the of the employees are not French. Uh, and and the, this is this is a serious question because our I mean, the market is looking for more and more, uh, more and more for tech profiles. And what we have in the in the employment market is not enough to cover the needs for all the companies and all the sectors are looking for the same profile. So this is why also maybe it's important to start to think about uh, how we can attract uh, foreign profiles to our countries and to our companies. Yeah, and work together as a, let's say, profession maybe. Uh, well, uh, one important topic also from the audience, uh, which is well rated, is, is still uh, what are the challenges using data science, uh, AI and data analytics in IA? What, what are the challenges? Maybe, Robert, you can comment on that one. Uh, it's a very topic close to your heart, so I know. <laughs> probably the biggest challenge is actually the data itself um, yeah. on one side the accessibility of the data do you have the data in, in the right form and for an internal audit department the what what is the advantage is that even if you have data quality issues you can actually erase that that's already a finding but for the business Data quality is, is definitely a, a big issue. Bias in data, if you look at AI, um, if you have bad training data, your model are then misbehaving, uh, you have model um, drift. Um, so there's a lot of, of risks with um, um, using data and not the right data or not uh, the right models. And um, I would say auditability is often uh, an issue. Um, if we are having not the right procedures, if we, for example, um, deploy an AI model that needs to be auditable um, to make sure that we come also to the right conclusions. So um, I would say these are then our audit risks ourselves to ensure that we follow all the right uh, procedures. Um, I would say that I see these as, as the main um, and then also the right conclusions um, with, with the data we're using. Um, I would say that in, in addition to the HR element getting the right people because it's, it's still not the machines who do the data analytics, it's locally um, uh, the people. So getting the right people on, on board is, uh, I would say, the, the last risk in, on top of that yeah. challenge. Yeah, that is a challenge and maybe that's not a question on this list, but I think also a question what I'm very curious about eh? because we, you mentioned these are the biggest challenges on data science and data analytics, uh, but digitalization also brings new risks. Uh, uh, what are the biggest risks you think on digitalization? I think Gerard mentioned it already a little bit on IA, yeah? so the, the, the ethical part, which is maybe sometimes forgotten uh, is there something you would like to add on that robert what are the yeah bigger risks in in, in digitalization uh, projects or developments in companies yeah i would say uh, having the right um the right investment capabilities and where do we invest i mean if we invest in digitalization where we don't have the right outcome, then uh, that investment can actually lead even um, to shortfalls uh, within our businesses. So um, having the right decisions where to invest, in my view, is probably the biggest risk. And also um, lost opportunities are the, the, the similar risks, you know, 
Um, so it's not only where we invest, but where we don't invest um, in, in top of that. And then you have all the project risks, security risks, um, data privacy risks, ethical risks, uh, bias risks, yeah. side risks uh, on, on top of all these opportunities. Um, so there's no opportunities without risk, is a nice say. Um, yeah, that's, that's also in the question. The big, biggest opportunity is uh, well, to be ahead of the market, of course. <laughs> and one of the risks is yeah, to lag behind, eh? to be uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, too slow on that. Uh, that is uh, so something. Uh, I think we're a little bit in time, uh, Pascal, aren't we? Or <laughs> I need to close. Yeah, we only we have two to, minutes. Uh, we need to close, please. Yes, please, I will, I will. Well, uh, thank you very much, Sharia, uh, uh, Robert and Adele. Well, thank you very much for all the knowledge you shared and, and the information you give. I think uh, what we learned from you that it is uh, important to be brave and to be bold, eh? <laughs> to uh, just start uh, doing it, eh? trial and error. And uh, I think Gerard mentioned it. Uh, uh, fail fast, uh, learn fast, and that only is not the case for the business, but that's also the case for uh, for it, us as internal auditors, uh, because uh, what we also already saw in the risk in focus uh, document, we think it is a very important topic, but the time spent on it is uh, still not enough, and, and the gap is only rising towards uh, the future. So uh, uh, there's a lot of things happening uh, in, in our whole uh, yeah, all of the industries, I think, in the whole value chain and the whole value cycle. And uh, we as auditors should be present at the start of these developments and uh, uh, be involved uh, and think about, maybe that's uh, the final thing I would like to say, Pascal, and think about the right products uh, to uh, uh, have uh, quick, uh, quick reports, uh, to be agile and to be uh, close to the topic. Uh, that is, uh, thank you very much. This is uh, where we want to finish because we are exactly at two o'clock. <laughs> we managed. <laughs> thank you to all the panelists for the very interesting discussion. And as mentioned before, you can still fill in the CPE and you will receive the recording of today's session with the key messages. Thank you to everyone and uh, have a good afternoon. Thanks a lot.